Okay, so I think we're ready to get started. I just wanted to welcome everyone to this uh, session of At What Point Managed Retreat. My name is Eve Mosher, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Kamantunde, and we're also joined by our session host, Brianna. And uh, Sarah and I are here to present um, on working with water as site and material, cultural compassion for retreat. So I will go ahead and start sharing. Um, I'm going to present for a little while uh, on my work, and then Sarah will present on her work, and then we will collectively present on an experimental arts organization that we are part of called Works on Water, and then we will have time for questions. You can type your questions into the feature, um, and oh, my phone just <laughs> rang, um, and then we will get those questions and have time to answer questions at the end of the session. So let me go ahead and share. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm Eve Mosher. You'll hear from Sarah in just a moment, and we will be talking about working with water as site and material, cultural compassion for retreat. So what exactly do we mean by um, cultural compassion? Cultural ca compassion, uh, when I'm sort of speaking to that, comes from the way that I work in creating arts and arts projects um, that live outside of what you might normally think of as art. It's very much outside the institutional walls of galleries and museums. Um, and it's the kind of work that works within communities and plays a role when thinking about climate migration, managed retreat, plays a role in kind of delivering different aspects of what is required to do compassionate um, climate migration. And that is telling the truth of the data, of the complexities of the changing world that we live in. It is creating space and creative activities that help us grapple with the kind of grief and healing that's necessary to move on, to transform our uh, perspective on how the world is changing into a place of imagination. Um, and so I'm also doing work that really helps us imagine not only what the world will be, but what it might be. What is it that we want to see the world transform into. And so I'm gonna talk about that through the lens of three projects I've worked on. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Sarah and I are also gonna talk about um, Works on Water, which is a collective that is working across a lot of these boundaries and the waterways and working with communities on their changing um, coastlines. So the first project I wanna present on is a project that I started in 2007 called High Water Line. Um, and this project really very much was about translating the data into a sort of embodied, um, spatially relevant data. So it was drawing a chalk line, a blue chalk line around 75 miles of New York City um, coastline. And the line was drawn at 10 feet above sea level, a relevant um, data point that talks about where the water will come. Um, at the time when I did it in 2007, it was still kind of, um, it wasn't set in stone. Now we are locked into, um, extensive flooding and storm surge to that line um, somewhere of up to every four years. And then that, the timeline on that is sort of rapidly advancing um, as to when that's going to happen. So that means that these neighborhoods are really going to have a very different experience um, of, than what they have at the moment. And the project was really about creating enough of a kind of interesting moment, a spectacle, so to speak, to allow people to have conversations with me about the changes they were already seeing, what we were expected to see, um, what is the science that backs this up, and then what what is our role in that? What can we do? And at the time, it was about advocacy um, and getting the sort of representatives and people in power to pay attention to uh, the impacts of sea level rise. Um, as time went on, I ended up doing the project in partnership with Heidi Quante, who is someone who has a lot of experience in community engagement. And we took the project to other communities where they undertook the project on their own. And a big part of that was actually setting up um, space and time. We would work with a community, some communities very short, four months, some communities up to two years, where we were hosting a lot of different kinds of creative workshops which allowed people to come to grips with the reality, that kind of truth moment, and then also go through the time and experiences necessary to grapple with the kind of grief and healing. Um, we did a lot of storytelling workshops, solutions workshops, uh, just getting to know one another workshops, and then really designing the project 
um, the high water line project that they wanted to enact. Um, and uh, the project for a lot of people was really transformational. You go through this process of the workshops, but then actually drawing the line is itself a pretty powerful moment. Um, doing something that's sort of physical in public space, in the spaces that will be impacted, um, can have a really powerful effect on participants. So the project has gone on to happen in a number of different communities around the world, and it now exists um, as a guide that's online that is open source for other communities to undertake it. It has been used uh, recently by Stockholm, a group in Stockholm, Sweden, a group in Hawaii. And so it's sort of evolving and showing up in different iterations around the world and kind of has a different meaning now that we're locked in, but it does give people a chance to kind of create a space um, for like, I, I kind of talk about pre-memory, like thinking about what's going to change and how is it going to change. Um, and since that project, I've gotten really in, into the idea of like, we need to create that space for having the difficult conversations about the truth, but we also need to create, and we have need to have space for the kind of healing. We also need to create a really strong space for imagining what's possible. Um, this is a, our tricycle, which is a, a a tricycle with a tree in it that is going around Philadelphia this summer. It's part of a much larger project in partnership with the Trust for Public Land in Philadelphia and three artists and artist groups uh, working with local neighborhoods who are all suffering from um, urban heat impacts. So their communities are up to 10 degrees hotter than surrounding communities. Um, not specific to the water, but still specific to the changing environment that we're living in and, and the disproportionate impact on certain communities. So the tree circle is going around different communities. It's uh, creating a space for shade and conversation about what are you already feeling? And then also the conversation around what, what could you imagine the world to look like if we do everything right? If we respond and we create a world that is um, adapting to the changing climate. So um, with a lot of those conversations, I will be creating um, an immersive audio scape and digital um, projection piece that will then travel around Philadelphia that includes the voices of the people that we've spoken to it or creates a sort of I, I, you know, visual ideas of what could be. Um, and I haven't embedded some piece, but I forgot to click the button to share the audio. Um, so I will just go ahead and move on because we do have a, a lot we can cover. So I will, if we have time, maybe I can play that later. Um, so I also wanted to share a project that's ongoing um, called Story of Tomorrow, which is taking that kind of idea of um, the embodied immersive experience a step further. And it is creating um, what are called um, uh, projection mapping. So you're sort of projecting onto specific surfaces that mirror and mimic those surfaces, but give you a sense of kind of immersive uh, being in space. This is a mock-up for a piece in South Street Seaport, which was focused on this idea of living with the water flowing in and out. And the audioscape would be, was going to be voices of people who have experienced flooding in the neighborhood, but also who start to imagine, well, what is it like if we, once we go through that process of uh, understanding the data, there's some creative space and time to uh, deal with the grief and healing. And then how can we imagine what the world could look like in a way that starts to get us to the point of wanting to advocate for the changes necessary to adapt to the world around us shifting and changing. So those are the kind of steps that I'm working on with the work. It's really is, it's, it's the, the truth of the data, it's the space and creative outlets for the grief and healing and then creating space and kind of immersive experiences around imagined futures um, those speculative futures if we as artists are able to create enough of a sense of possibility um, people kind of want that there's a term called urban tacticalism um, they did this in times square where they put in like a pop-up space for seating and pedestrianization and once it was there people really wanted to keep it and so it became a real thing and i think as artists you know providing space for this kind of like space of possibility um, can get us to the point where we're really actually sort of demanding that we want these changes to happen. Um, so that, those are the kind of spaces uh, that I'm working in and I will now stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Sarah. 
Although I feel like you should have, it would have been good to see just that, that last image that Eve showed is her amazing painting of the waterways, which ties into works on water, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so you can always bring that one back later too. Um, okay. Hi everyone. Um, it's so good to be here. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, team. What an incredible, um, what an incredible, uh, experience we've been having with our with this uh, conference and all these conversations about managed retreat. I am trying to share my screen. There we go. Okay, I think that I think I'm doing it. Here we go. Um, all right, so that's my name. And um, I identify as an interdisciplinary artist who's working at the intersection of performance, video, and public art, often in relationship to time and scale um, and environmental concerns. Um, just to give you a tiny um, context to my work, um, my background was actually as a theater director, um, making a lot of site-specific work. Here are just a couple images um, from past and present works. Uh, that are outside of the main thing I'm going to talk about, but um, I do a lot of projecting on buildings, um, working with bodies in space, and thinking a lot about time and awareness, uh, long-term thinking. Uh, but the project I'm really going to talk about is 36.5, a durational performance with the sea, which began in 2013 um, in response to Hurricane Sandy hitting New York City. I'm going to start with a video that I'm just going to let you watch and I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Okay, so when Hurricane Sandy hit New York City, I, as an artist, I had been working on this other project that was about sustainability as an artist in the, in the, on, a, on a daily basis. And I had this sudden realization or understanding in my gut that um, it might be possible that New York City could disappear in my lifetime. And I kept imagining this little artist running around New York City trying to make ends meet while the city is just sinking beneath her feet. 
And um, that image was in my brain for about nine months. And then I was up in Maine and I realized, I was at the Bass Harbor, Maine, and I realized that the tides could be a metaphor for sea level rise, for environmental change. And I, um, one day I just started, I was watching this rock that you can see on the, on the screen here, and I just watched it get swallowed whole over the course of about 30 minutes. And I was riveted. It was like the most in, most um, suspenseful performance I had ever seen. And I imagined a human body out there in the water. And I thought, oh, who can I convince to go stand in the water for me? And then very quickly realized that I was actually going to have to do it myself if I wanted to create this image. So there I stood three days later um, in the water for 12 hours and 48 minutes as the tide rose on my body and then um, receded again. And as I was out there, I had this a moment where I realized um, from a bodily perspective rather than an intellectual perspective that how just how connected we are all around the world because of our water. Of course, we know this intellectually. We talk about it all the time, but I felt it in my body and I wondered what is that person in Bangladesh what are they feeling and thinking about in terms of sea level rise? How about that person in Brazil? What are my, our friends, our sisters and our brothers across the world thinking about all these things and feeling and experiencing right now due to climate change and sea level rise? Um, and so I decided to continue the project um, and I did a research version in Mexico and then I went to San Francisco Bay, which is um, the water that I grew up closest to. Um, and developed um, some other aspects of the performance in addition to me standing. I walk out there at low tide, the water rises on my body, goes back down again. I collaborated with other local artists to create what I call the human clock, um, which is a participatory performance it, moment that um, anyone can join in to mark the passing of each hour. And it happens in different ways in different locations. I decided that I would go all, that I wanted to go to different places around the world and connect with communities, collaborate with them to create this performance work. So the piece, the time lapse that you saw at the beginning, that was from the North Sea in the Netherlands in 2015. Um, this is a photo with a bunch of government officials and water managers standing with me. Some of you might know Hank Ovink um, of Rebuild by Design. That's him in the gray suit next to me. Um, and so, and then people kept on joining in. So it really became this participatory performance event. In the Netherlands, it was the first time that I also um, filmed the entire thing in real time and then turned that into a durational video work that was the same length as the performance um, that was shown in a few different uh, museums and gallery spaces in Amsterdam. Um, and I continue to show the work in this way um, now with two channels showing different moments in time and hopefully it's a 12 hour, this one is a 12 hour 46 minute video um, and I hope that people engage in slow looking as they're experiencing it um, and they really kind of can see the tension that's occurring. Um, this is in Bangladesh, the Bay of Bengal, the southern tip. Um, I collaborated with Brito Art trust and music became a really important part of this work here. Oh, that was some friends watching from the shore. Um, and then I went to Brazil in Salvador, Bahia, um, and was at this amazing little um, beach area at the right by Solar de Union, the community right here. And I collaborated with a bunch of street poets who marked the passing of the hours from the shore. This is them performing. That's me in the background. Um, and many, many people came out to stand with us. This is a nighttime shot um, from later on in the day. It was pretty awesome. Um, and then I went to Kenya. Um, and this is a little village about two hours south of Mombasa called Bodo Inlet, an incredible community um, I was really lucky to have been introduced to a bunch of wonderful people who, um, who were able to, uh, who knew this community and we were able to collaborate in a really exciting way. There was a big ritual to um, begin the performance, a town crier who announced um, that it was happening and then a big performance, uh, lots of singing and dancing that took place throughout the day um, along with many people joining me in the water.
there are so many stories to tell um, about details, but uh, I can't tell them all right now, but all these people mean so many things to me. I have such fond memories and I'm still connected to many of them. This is at high tide in Kenya. And as part of the Kenya work, we planted um, 700 mangrove trees on the day of the performance. That was another thing that could ha that people could do in addition to hanging out and just watching the slow rising of the water. Um, and those mangroves are, I'm told, are continuing to grow, and that is um, part of the coastal resilience plan for this village. Um, so it was exciting to contribute to that. Um, this is projecting the video um, when I. We film the whole thing in real time. I collaborate with a local filmmaker and then we edit it very quickly so that we can um, actually show it within the community that we're working in before I have to leave. I spend usually five or six weeks on the ground um, and this was projecting on the walls of Fort Jesus um, in Mombasa uh, as I was after, after the performance. Um, when COVID hit, I was actually over in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I was working with some incredible Maori collaborators, and we were getting ready to do the performance on March 29th. Everything seemed to be going well, and then, of course, the pandemic descended on us, and um, I we had to postpone everything. So I'm in touch with everyone over there, and we will be resuming this, but this is, this is also my background shot. I keep it here as a reminder as I to try to stay connected to these waters over there and to um, and as a reminder that it will happen I will go back the plan is now to do this um, performance in March of next year um, this is the map that shows the um, the places where I've done this work and um, and where I will go um, and then the the final work in the series is will be in New York. The idea has always kind of been to do this research around the world, this body research, um, and also, uh, and connect, see what we can, I can learn from all these amazing people, communities around the world, and bring some of that back to New York um, and, and share it here. So um, this is actually, a, uh, and things have changed because of the pandemic, this was a test stand that I did last year on September 5th, which was the date that was supposed to be the final performance in New York, um, but it ended up not uh, being able to be, obviously. Um, and But what's one of the amazing things about having this extra time is actually that I'm able to go much deeper into my um, connections with the local community here in New York. The location is the Cove at Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, and especially because of the people I've met around the world, and especially in Aotearoa, um, I have really the, the importance of connecting with um, indigenous folks who are here and, um, and doing work is, has become absolutely critical for me with this process. So this is a collaborator, Tecumseh, and his dad, Chief Reggie, who are Mictinicoc Turkey Clan. Um, and they were there as part of this event, and I'm continuing to work with them um, on the shore. Another thing I realized during this uh, test day was how interesting it is to layer these different, um, from an aesthetic perspective, to layer the, the different locations. So this is actually, it looks kind of blurry, but it's a, it's a screenshot from the live stream event where we were live streaming from Pallet's Cove um, on that test day, and I was layering it with some Kenya some images from the Kenya performance. Um, this is Fuse. He's one of the local um, folks who I've met and connected with who's very much a part of the process that I'm having now. Um, that process I'm calling Kin to the Cove um, as the way of really thinking through how can we look at a look at this at this very specific site and how can we reframe our relationship with this cove as our relation, as our relation, as our kin, um, and really digging in in a, many different ways from a stewardship perspective, from a civically engaged perspective, but really trying to uh, eco spheric eco perspective, really um, sort of trying to make the case, be, be organic about it, and making the case that if we care for um, these specific sites in this moment, um, that it will better prepare us for the future. Um, this is another shot from our last Kin to the Cove gathering. Um, and then as part of Works on Water, um, 
and 36.5 recently, um, I just did this uh, sort of mini tangential stand in the waters out in the Rockaways um, where they are experiencing sunny day flooding on a almost monthly basis um, with the full moon. And when I learned about this, it, it sort of shocked me and I thought, why are we as New Yorkers not paying more attention to this? This is like the clearest indication that climate change is here. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I wanted to do a mini stand. I worked with the Rockway Youth Task Force. So this is a, um, a friend from there who's standing with me. There were a bunch of them earlier, but I, I like this photo with the, with the truck coming through. Um, and here's another just experiment out uh, right at Jamaica Bay where you see the, literally the water comes up into the streets. Um, and so all this work, though, going back to 2017 with um, where there, with 36.5, Eve and I met and we were in, I guess we probably met in 2000, we met long earlier, but in 2016, we started a conversation and realizing well, along with many other artists that there was this, um, a real, in the zeitgeist, there was a, a artists were working with water as site and or material. And so we started this conversation and realized that as artists, we wanted to kind of frame this work as the environmental art of the 21st century. And so we began a triennial. Um, and this is our 2017 inaugural triennial. This is the entrance to that exhibit exhibition. This is indoor inside the space. It was at 3LD Art and Technology Center downtown. Um, it went for a month and um, we commissioned um, all these artists that we knew who were working with site and material out in 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 site specific places to actually try to translate their work in their participatory work into a um, a gallery environment which is something that um, was challenging and interesting to see this is what i this is a shot from my video installation um, and you can see actually eve's waterways that are painted on the floor um, here, uh, at, and, and you can get a whole, the whole map of New York was painted all over the floor, which was amazing. Um, this is a four channel video, and I'm going to hand it over to Eve to tell more about current, what's happening with current works on water right now as we speak. Sorry, I locked myself on mute. And uh, start to share without unmuting. Okay, so um, as Sarah mentioned, we started uh, with the triennial and um, soon sort of invested ourselves in doing a lot of different work related to the waterways. There are so many different people working on and with the waterways and we saw ourselves as sort of a natural convener and collaborator with a lot of those different organizations and individuals. So um, following the triennial in 2017, we started a residency on Governor's Island. So it's artists, researchers, other people who are working on and with the water. And we also started working very closely with the Department of City Planning Waterfront Division, who were beginning the process of writing their vision for the waterfront. Um, and we were we saw ourselves as natural partners in that, invited them to come out and be in residence at Governor's Island with the artists and uh, researchers, as well as uh, work with them as they were doing their outreach. And we started working on a project with them called Walking the Edge, which was, uh, let me open that tab. Oh, I can't do it that way. I'll just do this. Um, which was set to launch in 2020. Um, and it was meant to be us walking, uh, doing a durational walk. So just continuously walking the 520 miles of shoreline and inviting communities and organizations all to come out and walk with the artists for doing the walk and have conversations around the waterways, um, different issues that come up for all of us, whether it's access, changing shorelines, um, different kind of ways that we connect to and don't connect to the waterways. And um, of course, COVID hit. <laughs> and so we ended up doing instead a digital version of Walking the Edge where we had artists overtake Instagram each week and talk about their own connection to the waterways. Um, so Works on Water is continuing to produce work that is connecting 
different agencies and organizations to the waterways using creativity and artistry to do so and uh, really finding ways to um, frame the conversations that we have around the water in different ways. Um, so I am going to send this back to Sarah to kind of wrap up with a hydrofesto. Uh, Sarah, you're on mute. There we go. OK, um, <laughs> always the challenge in these times. Um, one of the things that we have been working on uh, currently is realizing that we really needed a we needed like a manifesto, but we wanted to call it a hydrofesto um, for works on water to be able to um, really put out to the world sort of what is the com what are the commonalities because a lot of the works that are connected with works on water and and what we're sort of defining as water art is they're so different um and so we but but there's a sense that we all have of what brings us together um in addition to the working on and with the water so this is our um draft of a hydrofesto it hasn't been finalized yet so this might actually be the sneak preview the first time we're sharing it with the world but um but just to just to kind of give you a sense of how we are thinking about things as a collective um and let's see, I don't know, shall I, uh, shall I, I'm going to read it out loud. Um, <laughs> and you guys can all read along with me. Okay, so the Works on Water Hydrofesto, we are bodies of water and we maintain solidarity and kinship with all water bodies worldwide. We are genre fluid and embody water's form to create shape-shifting, temporal, interdisciplinary works made on, in, and with water. We are socially engaged with our multi-species communities in participatory and experimental ways. We believe that water art is uniquely positioned to repair our broken relationships with the natural world and respond to the urgency of our climate crisis. We work with bodies of water as site to reimagine and reclaim the hydro commons for all. We work with water as collaborator to guide our research and share the creative process in a culture of reciprocity. We work with water as medium to redefine the art world's definition of material and reject the anthropocentrism of the extractive capitalism. We build rhizomatic water art networks to invigorate collectivity and connectivity locally and globally. And we declare water art the environmental art of the 21st century. That's our dramatic ending. Um, but really that's kind of, that statement is, is what we're trying to do from an artistic perspective is really put this, um, place this work um, in a historical context, art context, um, so that it uh, has resonance beyond this moment. Um, and let's see that I'm, this is, we love connecting. We love collaborating. Um, this is all of our contact information. Um, if you'd like to connect with us, we'd, we'd love to, we love uh, engaging in the policy conversations and in the academic conversations and all of that. And I think we just whipped through our, um, our presentation. So we are ready for questions. Unless you have anything else you want to share, Eve. No, I'm ready. I'm ready for questions, or I have some questions too. Maybe we could start off with asking each other some questions. Um, and particularly given the fact that we are here at a managed retreat conference and recognizing the, you know, your 36.5 and my high water line, how much they have to do with rising waters. And that is entirely what the managed re retreat and climate migration is um, responding to. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, what kind of conversations you might have had with people, how the work that you did might have facilitated those conversations and thinking about how you spoke to it a little bit about the mangroves, like how are people responding to those changing edges? Mm, yeah, it's such a good question. Um, I guess what I notice is that um, it really is, from from my perspective as an artist, I feel like we are uniquely positioned as artists to have to have these conversations because we are so invested in this like one on one connection and um and because we have um we t at least i tend to i shouldn't speak for myself um i think there's an emotional connection that 
that um, we are inherently um, trying to have. And so I think, I guess what I notice is that I, I have a lot of conversations with people um, or it's just like to kind of taking the time to actually be in conversation with people and be able to um, to shift and and like one thing I often talk about is how um, you know that act of the reason I invite people to come and stand in the water with me is because that actual the action of of feeling something in your body um, and the experience of feeling this the water change in your body is um, that stays with you in a way that um, I don't think words can <laughs> you know it like this experience um, really re has I've seen it resonate with people you know there have been these Dutch government officials or water managers who swim every day and there's Bengali fishermen and there's Brazilian street poets and this one amazing 17 year old Vinicius who is our production assistant who told me after he stood in the water with me for two hours he said he felt like a tree um, just spreading out and and deepening into into the earth and had this whole new perspective on the water even though he lives right next door to it you know um, and so those are the moments that I'm after is when I can see um, it really move someone or I can see it shift in their brain um, because they've had this experience with me and and that's yeah that's what I'm I'm really interested in um, in it and the one, I think it's about the taking the time and the one-on-one -on -one connection um, that we just, as artists, we inherently, or at least artists in the works on water community, <laughs> we inherently go for. How about you? I'm going to throw that back to you. Yeah, no, I'm actually seeing, I'm seeing so many different parallels, which I think we've, we've probably talked about before, but in the, in the context of this, you know, this idea that we're having, the, we're, we're creating space for these conversations that's outside of media specific science lecture you know the confines of a community board meeting any of those kind of things so there's a space to actually have these conversations i think also the time is such a i mean obviously that's so much about what your project is about um you know the idea that you're not going out for a swim and coming back right you're not moving through the water you're not passing over the water you're standing in the water and kind of allowing the water to come to you. And I think that's probably like, as you're saying, like that's so powerful. I could see how, you know, just being being really still can be really powerful for people anyway to like do that and feel the water changing around them. I think um, kind of really connects one to the changing water in a way that there's just nothing, nothing else that can do that. Um, I think also the fact that our work is so site so site specific mm -hmm. right yours is rooted in this place where the water is changing mine is about literally drawing the line where we expect to see um increased flooding and storm surge and it's you know mine's not exact because floods are never really going to follow exact lines um, although the water does tend to go where it wants to go um you know but like doing that in the place where the impacts are going to be felt can be really powerful as well i think for the high water line experience like literally you know we spend so much time prepping for the project and talking about it and looking at the maps and drawing the paths and getting permits and all this stuff. and then you go out and you draw the line and you're like oh you know even if you pre-walked it like i pre-biked and walked all of the new york city line i was like okay there's a horse stable here and a, a senior care home here in hospital in school and but then you're drawing this line through those environments and like lines themselves have such loaded uh there's sort of a loaded thing anyway um that it can feel really powerful for people to kind of do that and then to do something what we're both doing is sort of a bit of a spectacle mm -hmm. and then you get so you have i feel like i have two audiences and you do too right we have the audience that are the close participants who are showing up, who are standing in the water, who are drawing the line. And then there's that secondary audience of who they talk to. Mm -hmm. So when someone's drawing the line, they talk to someone passing them on the street or they draw the line past someone sitting in a cafe and the person at the cafe is like, what are you doing? And then you have this conversation. So same thing for you, people walking past you on the beach or seeing the video and the people who are actually participating mm -hmm. in the project, not you, end up having the conversations. And, mm -hmm. you know, often that's talked about in the climate world, like the most important thing you can do to sort of fight, combat all these 
terribly war heavy words, um, climate change is to talk about it, mm -hmm. right? So we're creating the space for that to happen. Um, and I think in terms of managed retreat and climate migration, there's so much need for just that conversation to start and then to put people in a position where they actually feel like they have some kind of agency, right? Which we're, we're hoping to do that through um, this kind of participatory work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, to totally. Just to jump in on that, like the, um, the, sort of act of of connecting with the water or connecting either the physical water or the line of the water I think is about actually it's that positive awareness I I think of it as positive it's sort of terrifying if you but it, or it could be terrifying but it's um but it's actually about oh no we have agency to reconnect with our water and and to read reimagine um this site and where we are and what our human place is in the world um and that's a that's a really amazing thing actually um so i feel like also i'm always sort of thinking about extremes it's like the terror of what could happen and the like beauty and positive thing of what could happen and that it's very nuanced um and, and I'm really interested in what each person who encounters a work, um, what resonates with them. Like I have at the heart of it for me is this question about sea level rise and I will always, um, and extreme weather events and that, that I will always bring it back to that. But people see really different things. And I think there's just value in like deeply connecting with water in, <laughs> and people have so many stories to share. There's like so many stories. Um, yeah, I can't possibly tell them all. <laughs> Do you have a story of someone you encountered when you were doing the high water line that has really like stayed with you? Yeah, no, I'm lucky with there's so many. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, there's there's and I think that's part of it too. Like part of part of what people need uh, in this kind of changing world is they need someone to hear. Um, they need to, they need someone to listen to their stories. And, you know, it was really the first time I did the high water line project, I had never done any kind of performance or public art like that. And I felt like just the weight of carrying those stories was enormous. And like, I, I wrote a blog every night when I came home, cause I was like, I have to, I have to do something with those stories and I want to honor them um, and share them in some way. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's funny cause now I feel like my work has gotten to the point where it, I'm literally creating a way to capture and share those stories, right? Like I'm doing all these audio scapes. So I'm like, what's the story and how can I share it out to a bigger audience? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of weight in, in carrying those, those shared experiences. I do see that we have a question that's come in, um, which is, are there any water related dance performances? And I think we both have probably experience of that. I know I'll answer right quick that in uh, when Del Rey, when I, when people use the high waterline guide, they kind of, it really is just a guide. It's not, you don't have to do it exactly this way. Here's a guide to how it can be done and you kind of make it your own. And the community of Del Rey, they also worked with um, the water dances group. I'll have to look it up while the we're global talking. Water and they did a whole, yeah, they did like a whole blue water procession um which was about sort of marking the line through they did it at night so they had um like blue costumes and, and lights and things and sort of mark the line through dance um so and i know sarah you have a much stronger connection even to like kind of choreography and yeah well i i definitely like um the i think i showed the image of the be the beginning of the human clock uh that's part of 36.5 um which is related i think you know the and movement is definitely part of my practice um movement-based performance work but um but there's a lot of choreographers and dancers who are doing creating lots of things that are related to water um there the at the thing that maybe Eve was talking about was this or there's an organization called global water dances um which is i think they they like try to connect um dancers around the world um to do these water related dances on a particular day 
once a year or something. Um, and they're, they're really wonderful. A lot of people have gotten involved in that, but then there's a lot of like New York based choreographers who have done stuff. We have with works on water. We've worked with Mayfield Brooks is one of our artists, um, who's doing an incredible piece about, um, called whale fall right now. It just had an exhibition and, um, they did a performance at Abrams art center earlier this year. Um, yeah, Christina Cantonese um, is another dancer, uh, choreographer who, who we work with. There's, there's several. You can always reach out to us and we can point you in the right direction if you're looking for something specific. Um, and oh, we have another question. Having people participate in the events and experience the water physically is very powerful. Is there a sense that this will bring people to embrace white, rising water to learn to live with wet feet? rather than fleeing or fearing the water. I guess in relationship to managed retreat, that's, um, I mean, yeah, I, I think from an artistic perspective, I'm always trying to keep the questions really open. So um, I'm interested in, in what I do believe that we need to facilitate managed retreat um, and we need to learn how to adapt um, and live with water in different ways um, I I think it's uh, Eve always talks about systems thinking and so um, having all these different possibilities is what I'm interested in as an artist sort of letting letting um, letting letting there be many possibilities and sort of helping to facilitate the conversation and and you know let the people who are who are going to have to move make that choice um so but i guess yeah i don't know do you want to add into that <laughs> that question yeah no it's funny because i think really specifically about miami who was also dealing with sunny day flooding and um and yeah there was kind of a sense of I think because we were just like, this is what's going to happen. We're going to, and we created the space to really process. There was one participant who just like had no idea and saw the map and the house that he thought he was going to give to his son. He realized like, that's just not going to happen. And there was like a real process. We saw him go from like real grieving to like healing to being one of the biggest advocates out on the streets um, for the project. And I think he really did start to think about like, okay, if the waters do rise, um, you know, what does that mean? How do we maintain our historical spaces? How do we, how do I continue to live with this? Um, or how do we change the, the environment, you know, in, in a way that's like, because we're being kind of creative and proactive about this, we have a chance to kind of think differently about how we live with the water. So I do think that the, um, the kind of creative working with the facts <laughs> um, does allow people to access them in a really different kind of different minded way that maybe is a little less defensive. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that, I think that that's sort of, I guess that's why like I am an artist <laughs> or why I think a lot of people who are, who are artists are, are really interested in those questions living as questions rather than any sort of, top-down decision um, of course we all have opinions or th or things that we think should maybe happen but um, like I was in the session last night with the Stanford um, research group and there were these binary questions of like should it be this or should it be this and it was like no it's always in between like those were great in terms of um, just prompting the discussion but it's like basically it's never this or this it's like it's always going to be nuanced and um, and and people are going to come from really different places and just how can we collectively and like individually and collectively as a community as um, a city you know citywide as a nation or as a non as a species how can we um, rethink um, the way that we're doing things um, and and asking those questions is the place where I like to be personally. <laughs> um, and, and while always hoping to point, um, you know, make the, the, hard, the hard 
things uh, possible or make them seem possible, you know? I wonder if we have any other questions. We haven't been reminding people to put questions in the chat. We've just yes. been talking, talking, talking. <laughs> yeah, if you do have questions, put them in the chat. They will, will make their way to us. Um, it's funny, Sarah, that you bring out this idea. I think, you know, I've been doing this work around climate change for a long time and people have always said like, oh, you're an activist artist and blah, blah, blah. I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I think the fact that, because I don't see it as binary is so much a part of it. Like I'm not looking for a specific outcome. I want to allow people to experience what, you know, I do work a lot with science and research and allow people to understand the experience of science and research. And yes, of course I have a certain direction that I want things to go, um, but that's not my intention with the work. My intention is not to force, um, a specific outcome. It's mm -hmm. to create the space to consider many outcomes um, and to create a sense of connection to the environment, whatever that is, right? If it's changing, um, you know, if it's an urban environment, a rural environment, if it's water, to create a sense of like, I am a part of this environment and I have, we've talked, we've got, like, I have some agency and I can mm -hmm. sort of, you know, make choices. Um, around what, what my environment becomes. Um, so it's kind of just giving a lot of information in a digestible way, maybe in, in a creative way, and then allowing that evolution to happen. Yeah, it's interesting. There's that like activism art question comes up a lot. And I, I think I, I have sort of resisted the activism because there are so many people who want to place this into an activist space and I'm like it's actually art first and foremost because I believe that art actually can change perspectives you know perhaps more um, when it really hits someone deeply it um I think activism is great too um and, and we need the activists but I know like from for me what I'm trying to do is create really complex simple but complex imagery that um and experiences that that like shift people on a really deep level um and it takes yeah it takes a lot of us so that's why we need all the folks with works on water doing this work in order to just like change the world yeah. although I'm nurturing more and more and more and more artists <laughs> although isn't it so interesting how like from the moment like i remember thinking when i started 36.5 in 2013 i was already like way behind you you started so much earlier Eve but like I remember thinking like wow I could see people's eyes kind of glaze over when I mentioned if I mentioned sea level rise and so I actually took it out of my vocabulary um but then now of course it, I I and I remember thinking okay if this is where we're at in 2013 where are we going to be in 2020 and that was actually why I said okay I'm going to finish the series in 2020 and see where we are as a society and I do feel like what's cool and fun about doing this project long term is that there there has been a real shift there's a real palpable and i mean even the fact that this conference is happening you know again this year and that there are so many amazing people who are working on managed retreat even though like you know new york city is having a hard time talking about it <laughs> directly the um it's it's amazing that there's so many wonderful thinkers who are who are on this and i do feel like we can really feel the shift in in the collective consciousness which is exciting yeah any more questions <laughs> yeah. i i hope people are there <laughs> I think so. We got some questions. No, it's. I was actually going to jump back to something you said a minute ago um, about the idea. Oh, I can't even remember what exactly it was you said, but it prompted me thinking about, you know, um, one of the things that creative cultural producers are really good at is creating a kind of emotional connection. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is often missing in the conversations around the changing world. And th that's the moment where you really need it. Because we all have percept, we all have perceptions about what the future holds, and it's just not the reality. And so, you, we need this space for kind of the emotional connection to the changing world. And I, you know, I have certainly seen changes. Like if I were to go do high water line in New York again, it would be from a very, I myself have changed my practice and how I approach it has really changed, but also the fact that we're locked into that now, 
means that it would be, you know, a totally different project. And it's sort of interesting that you started your project seven years, seven years ago, right? Seven years ago. No, nine thinking, years ago. Oh, get out. <laughs> no, Sandy was nine years ago. It was eight years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. Eight years ago. You st yeah. But it started from Sandy, right? Yeah. Like it started in New York and it's coming back to New York and how it is true. We are in a really different place with all of this mm -hmm. and the conversation has altered dramatically. And I think that's fantastic. And I think it's because of all the work that everybody working on mm -hmm. climate issues and adaptation issues is um, grappling with. And I, I just hope we can continue to share and build bridges and work across the different disciplines because I also think that's going to be really important. Like I can't do the art without the research and the academic papers and the people doing the like the follow on work of like showing up and helping communities with the, you know, with the choices that they have to make. And, uh, you know, hopefully artists can play a big role in all of this. I see a question coming in. Sarah, your locations are so beautiful. <laughs> have you considered suiting up protectively and immersing yourself in a tide of plastic? What about different ways to- I'm not to that into plastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, the research version in Mexico ended up being very much about this direct in human impact on the environment because I was in Acumal Bay, which is a place that was getting, as I was there, there were there was this new hotel being built. And initially, I thought, oh, I'll just choose the most beautiful location. But then the community actually, in com through conversations with them, I realized that for that site, it was most important to do it um, in a place that uh, was kind of was directly confronting the fact that there was all this development happening that was going to cause more and more harm to the bay. Um, but it's still the imagery still was beautiful because I wasn't showing the um, hotel, but we felt it in the in the performance and and you kind of see the people who are there as tourists. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of artists who are doing work with plastics. So I feel like I, that's, I'm sort of going after um, my aesthetic is, is really about um, sinking into this, like showing the water as vast, um, water as, as my collaborator, as our collaborator, and the vastness of the water and, and the beauty. So I, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the beauty. Um, but I we can point you to lots of artists who are doing stuff with plastic, if that's something that's interesting to you. Um, let's see. Oh, there's something else. Well, yep. and we, have, we have one more question, but we're also yeah. out of time. <laughs> so I do want to just say thank you to everyone. Um, I don't know, Brianna, if we can stay on and answer this one question <gasps> before we um, sign off, but if people need to leave to go to other sessions, you can certainly do that. Um, and opposition for our work and performances. Uh, mine usually came from sort of permit, permitting. Um, I was drawing the line right through the World Trade Center's uh, building site to so kind of the some of the office, city offices being against it. But people on the street, I mean, you know, I think, Sarah, you probably approach this the same way. It's like you kind of meet, literally meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. And it's about having the conversations that resonate with them. So I certainly did a lot of sort of research on understanding what different arguments are. And I never really positioned myself as like, I'm here to argue with you. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm, you know, but I can kind of find out what do you know and how do we, how do we meet you where you are, both literally and figuratively. Right. And that's, that's the beauty of being an artist and focusing on the questions, right, is that we don't have to, um, we're really trying to have that con human connection. So, um, so it's, yeah, it's possible, like, even when people are in opposition to the work, there's definitely, there's always people who don't get it or who are upset by it or like, what is this, you know, um, but it's interesting to kind of slowly engage with the people who are in opposition to it and see what happens. Um, I also wanted to mention that, um, so the 36.5, the finale will now be happening in 2022. And I hope anyone who is in New York will come and stand with me in the water. It'll happen in September, 2022, mark your calendars. 
Um, and we'll also be live streaming it around the world. So um, there's ways to see it everywhere. Um, but and, and then from a Works on Water perspective, I think we're really interested in um, in collaborating and 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 from a civic perspective, from a policy perspective, from an academic perspective, um, we'd love to see more artists um, engaged in these conversations. We know a bunch of artists who are who are engaging in the conversations, but from that perspective, so um, please do reach out if you um, if you want to if if that seems interesting to you and you're interested in in this perspective coming at things from an emotional place. <laughs> Um, any last and words? with that yeah I think we'll say thank you um, again please do get in touch and we're really pleased to be able to be a part of the conference and look forward to continuing to attend and learn from the rest of the conference as well so thank you all yes thank you for an amazing conference thank you Brianna do we need to do anything to no, I'm just going to share the closing slide for the lag and you guys can go ahead and sign off. Okay, thank you.